Hello everybody, I'm back again with another daily video here. Today, I have an interesting question for you all. Do anti-vaxxers ruin the herd immunity? Sources in the description box below. I thought it was a good question. Herd immunity is when there's a certain section of the population that is resistant to a specific disease and as a result, the disease dies out. So for example, if it takes 80% of the population to be able to be resistant to say COVID and 20% of the population decides to stay indoors, like people who are at risk, COVID would die out. That's the end of the disease. But do anti-vaxxers mess up the percentage of population in the US that decides to actually uh, take a vaccination that would be able to solve the problems related to COVID? Well, I think in order to answer this, we need to look at what percentage of the population is willing to take a vaccine, number one, what percentage of the population requires herd immunity? And also, <laughs> where have we seen this in the past? I don't know. I just thought this would be kind of an interesting little section, I guess you could say. Well, this gets a little complicated. Just a heads up on this. Pew Research Center and ABC Washington Post said that 70% of Americans are willing to take the COVID vaccine. However, the Associated Press and NORC, N-O-R-C, I think it's just NORC, NORC Research Center, their figures were around 50%, so a lot less than 70%, as we know. CBS poll said that 20%, this is what I found, 20% would take it right now, 60% would be willing to wait. Excuse me, not willing to wait, they would want to wait to see what happens to other people. So we have about 50% of the population that is willing to take it right now. Is that enough? Well, here's where it gets a little complicated. So herd immunity, it's not that widely known. This is where kind of our information about medicine kind of falls short. So herd immunity could be developed between 80% and 20% of the population. Yes, 80% and 20%, that's ridiculous, I know. That's a 60% gap. Many experts are claiming that we probably just need a significant amount of the minority, which is interesting. They don't specify percentage, so a significant amount of the minority would be, what, 49%? So a lot of these experts are claiming that we need 49%, which would be right about where we're at. So that's confusing. However, history might be able to better indicate where it is that we will, we will land when the vaccine actually comes out in mainstream. Are people going to accept it or not? Well, let's look at when these things have happened in 1885 let's choose that that's when uh that's when smallpox came out i just like forgot it first i was like it's where uh what was it the plague no smallpox back in the day there's an anti-vaccine movement and the idea of this movement was that people shouldn't take vaccines because it will hurt ready for this our rights and our freedoms and it is our body and it is our choice the idea back then was that vaccines hurt your ability to be free because it is the government controlling what it is that you want to do. Vaccines for smallpox, even polio, these things were, were highly, what's the word I'm looking for? Highly partisan. The same thing we're seeing now. There's an individual and his name was Dr. Alexander Ross. Now he was considered to be the only doctor who dared to Doubt the fetish of vaccinations. This guy literally created articles saying, well, no, don't take it. I'm a doctor. Look at me. I'm a doctor. Don't take the vaccine. For smallpox. This was their version of Ben Carson, I swear. I swear to God. Despite this, this guy actually took the smallpox vaccine at the beginning of the epidemic. This guy took it and then claimed that it, people shouldn't take it. The other thing that happened around here was the gaslighting. So the other concept here was that people were saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. Not a lot of people are dying, even though 30 to 40% of the people who had it died. Now I get it. You're going to say, well, COVID doesn't kill 30 to 40% of people. I get it. But it's the sentiment, the gaslighting. There's so many people who are affected by COVID, right? I mean, for example, you can't say it's not that big of a deal because even though there's only 0.02% of the population dies, that's the same amount of population 
that apparently has committed uh, voter fraud or the people who were victims of voter fraud. So we got to choose which one is it? Is that not big of a deal or is that percentage significant? Back in the day though, I will give them this. They were saying that uh, instead of saying the vaccines would commit autism and government chips were in them, they were instead saying that you could get syphilis and tuberculosis and blood diseases from it. That's partially true actually because they would stick needles in someone and then pull it out and stick it into someone right afterwards. However, the answers that we have about this really are going to come from this guy. His name is Jeffrey Fleer. He's a professor of physiology and medicine at Harvard University. He said, no, more than likely what we're going to be able to see is people having fights over the vaccinations and not people having fights over whether or not they should take vaccines. So historically, what we're seeing right now is more of a willingness to take it because of the fact that there's more people who are dying in front of us, more people who are getting sick and an increase in the foreclosures regarding businesses, which was something that didn't happen so much in the past. As a result of that, people are more willing to kind of brush off their belief systems in order to take it. I guess that's a good thing. There's a, there's a limited amount of information out there, but that's helpful. So fortunately, whether, whether people take it or not, isn't as relevant when everybody has access to the vaccination. I suppose once it becomes mainstream, if the anti-vaxxers decide not to take it, that's just evolution taking its course. Food for thought.